So in the Coleman household, when I was growing up, the newspaper was an important part of our family. I know newspapers are a thing of the past now, but as you may remember, newspapers used to tint your fingers. Well, they've of course changed now. Now it's all electronic, but for me, a newspaper is a fond family memory. Because when the paper came in, it was like my dad was the one who first got it. Now he's a very organized man, mind you. And so he kept his paper very organized. Section A, Section B, Section C, the comics, and then all the advertisements. And so he would read it one section at a time and then carefully put it back together again. So you can imagine, think about the day before Christmas when all the good sales are being announced. As kids, we wanted, in, as my mom, we wanted to look at all the advertisements. But there's my dad, section A, <laughs> section B. And we would carefully wait till he got through the whole thing. The comics was another part that I waited and waited and waited. And after he was done, was finally when we all got to look at it. The comics was, as a kid, my favorite time and my favorite part of the newspaper. I love the peanuts. And I can remember one particular peanut script where they actually had Linus and um, Charlie Brown. And it was a rain or a snowy day. There's tons of snow everywhere. And Linus and Charlie Brown, they had their hats on and they had their heavy coats on and they're trudging through the snow. There's piles of snow everywhere. Nothing is shoveled. And they walk past Snoopy's little house. And there is poor Snoopy outside the front door of his house, shivering. There's piles of snow on his head, piles of snow on his nose, all kinds of snow around him. And Charlie Brown walks by him and he looks at him and he says, have a good day, Snoopy. <laughs> <laughs> and Linus then continues and says, yes, Snoopy, have a good day. How many times have we said to somebody, have a good day without recognizing anything that's happening in their life? Today, we actually hear in our scripture reading the passages from James. James is not a book in the in the Gospels that we actually or in the Bible that we actually read often. But in this particular book, in this particular scripture, it was written by the author who is named James, and it was believed that he was Jesus' brother. Now, at the time when this particular um, scripture was put together, the Jewish Christian community, they were at a point in their lives where they were highly disruptive. All of the wars and all the power struggles and all of the different um, tribes that were coming in to control the trade route, they had disrupted the Christian community so much that they displaced them out of Jerusalem, away from the temple itself. And so now, here is this Christian Jewish community that was away from the temple, away from the place where they felt God the most. And so James was writing to this community out in the outskirts. And what's interesting about this is, is James is telling us throughout the entire book that he has written that we are to act out our beliefs. He encourages us to not just um, say what our belief is, but to actually do, to live out our belief, to not walk by Snoopy, who's obviously in dire straits in need of our help. This was an important message especially as people started living out in different communities. Because as people spread out, that also meant that there were many people in different communities in need. And we 
see that today. We are encouraged to not just give flowery language to somebody, but rather to take action. I was blessed to have an opportunity to take a week-long mission trip to the Salt Lake City Uncor um, Depot. In the United Methodist Church, we actually have two different depots, and our closest one is in Salt Lake City. And this is an amazing organization. It was actually created by a bishop in the United Methodist Church after World War II. He again saw all of the different disruptions in many people's lives. People who were taken away. People who were now going back to their homes. Going back to their communities. And oftentimes many of these individuals who were coming back home had nothing. Or else their world was greatly changed. And so this bishop recognized the need for not just flowery talk, but action. Action of putting our faith into being. And so he created UNCOR. UNCOR's mission is actually to help individuals as a humanitarian um, arm of the United Methodist Church. And so is designed to actually help people who need help. Now this depot, when you go there, this is really, I mean, a warehouse. And so when you walk into this warehouse, there's many different sections. And you see racks and racks and racks of different kits that have been assembled by volunteers like you and I. People who are willing to take action in their faith to help other people. And so when you walk in, there's just these boxes and boxes and boxes of all these kits that have been created. Now there's three specific kits that UNCOR works on. One kit is for, um, for school-aged children to make sure that they have supplies when they go into the classroom, that they have the crayons, the paper, and the pencils. The second kit that we, we um, actually assemble our flood kits. So those individuals who may be impacted by hurricanes like we're hearing today on the East Coast, those individuals have kits that are designed with cleaning products so that they can go in and actually start cleaning their houses after the flood water recedes. And then the third kit are the hygiene kits. And those are kits that this church is in the process right now of collecting items to for, so that we or, or somebody else at the depot can assemble them. And the hygiene kits are really just kits that helps people remain clean, to be able to have a fresh cloth so they can wash off their faces. When I was in um, on my mission trip, I actually was with multiple people throughout the Mile High area. And we were all coming from different churches, from actually even from Wyoming, because at that time I was appointed to a church in Wyoming. So we were all gathering together. And one of the gals at this particular mission trip, she told a story where she has worked with many people in the past and handing out the hygiene kits for those who are in need. And I asked her, what is the response when you actually give somebody a kit? And she said the one response that moved her the most is an individual that she didn't even know simply says thank you for a white cloth. Everything in my life is so dirty that having a brand new white cloth to wash my face gives me hope. A white cloth, something that you and I probably take for granted, but for that one moment in time was a change, was a spark of hope for a stranger. As we continue to look and do mission work in the depot, we notice that there are many different ways in which we can all serve. 
We can build the kits themselves, or as we are doing right now as a church, we're collecting items. So one part, one entire part of the depot is a receiving area where there's boxes and bags and boxes of bags, many of them, of different items, toothbrushes, toothpaste, band-aids, boxes and boxes and boxes of band-aids. And so we actually spent a lot of time also just sorting through everything, putting them into separate boxes so that then the kits, the three different kits can be assembled. It was hard work. It was hot. We were there at the end of June in Salt Lake City. They had these tiny little fans that kept us cool. And this was also a youth trip. But no one complained. Because the reality is we knew that we were one individual who was trying to help a stranger. And so we worked. What was amazing about this particular mission trip is the greatest lesson I learned is that I know I could have never completed all of the hygiene kits for all of the materials that people were donating and giving. I mean, literally, there were boxes and boxes of Band-Aids that came in as a generous gift. And on one hand, me, especially as somebody who's competitive and wants to complete things and always get to the finish line, I wanted to complete and make sure that all of the kits were made and assembled. But the reality is, I knew that I couldn't do it. I knew that my week would be over and there'd still be boxes and boxes of band-aids that needed to go into the hygiene kit. The valuable lesson that I learned is that it is a teamwork effort. I know that I came in for a week and I put my faith into action and I worked hard, but the job isn't complete. But I also had the confidence that there was another group of faithful disciples who were coming in behind me the next week and they were going to be faithfully in the hot warehouse, building the kits as fast as they can. But they too wouldn't complete the task. And they too would have to be comforted by the fact that there are other faithful disciples just like you who are all working together. It's just like Scott said. It's that one tiny little drop that creates the large ripple in the pond. Each and every one of you, you are that tiny little drop. May it be so.